Hi, um, I'm Woody Powell. I'm a professor at Stanford in uh, the School of Education and Management Science and Engineering and Organizational Behavior and Sociology. Um, and we're just delighted to have received this award. So we were asked to make a short video about our paper um, and we're gonna give it a whirl. Kurt, please introduce yourself. You bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm Kurt Sandholz. I'm an associate professor in the Romney Institute of Public, Public Service and Ethics at the Marriott School of Brigham Young University. And I worked with Woody on this paper while I was a PhD student at Stanford in Management Science and Engineering. Kurt and I were, uh, we're a really good team together. Um, Kurt took my organization theory class um, and I think his first year of graduate school um, and of course, I forced him to read early drafts of uh, the Patchett and Powell book on the emergence of organizations and markets. Um, that book was principally concerned with where do new ideas and new practices come from? You know, explaining emergence, explaining novelty um, is the key question that, uh, that John and I tackled. And we developed a lot of mechanisms or social processes, if you prefer, uh, softer term, things like transposition, um, recombination, refunctionality. Um, these were all um, uh, ways in which we thought ideas move from one domain to another. Um, Kurt caught the bug. He caught the bug quickly. Um, he started writing papers about, you know, where did Henry Ford get the idea for the assembly line? Where did Alfred Sloan get the idea of the multidivisional firm? And for his own work, he started thinking about the origins of modern human resource practices. I had been uh, studying the biotech industry. I had both, uh, uh, I had rich secondary data on business and scientific connections among uh, the participants in the industry, universities, venture capitalists, biotech firms, um, government labs, pharmaceutical companies. But I did not have, you know, firsthand data on individual companies and their origins. But conversations with Kurt got me thinking, maybe we could study the scientists and executives who created the very first firms. Um, John Padgett had studied Florentine families in this way. So Kurt and I said, why not? Let's try. So to develop detailed histories of anything, you need as many diverse sources as you can get. We looked everywhere for information on the earliest biotech firms, newspaper articles, transcripts of speeches, television interviews, S1 and 10K filings, scholarly and popular science books, unpublished PhD dissertations, basically anything we could get our hands on. Three sources were game changers. First, we received multiple cardboard moving boxes of primary and secondary, secondary material from Martin Kenny which he'd used to write his dissertation in the early 80s on the origins of biotech. Second, we found a terrific set of in-depth interviews with biotech founders, attorneys, venture capitalists, and eminent scientists archived in the Oral History Center, the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And then third, we realized that the relative recency of the phenomenon we were studying meant that a lot of the people who founded these companies in the 70s and 80s were still alive in 2009. We had only to send them emails, explain our project, and conduct phone interviews, which supplemented gaps in the archival record. So collecting this crazy array of data took the better part of a year, but was actually a lot of fun. Yeah, that was quite a time collecting that um, and these boxes arriving. We didn't have a fixed idea of how to compare the organizations. There were too many um, uh, organizations for careful case comparison, uh, like Kathy Eisenhardt and Kurt's department often does with samples of four or six. And yet there are too few for correlational analysis. There are 26 organizations founded in biotech's first uh, decade. So we had what Kurt called a tweener sample, um, too big and too small. 
Um, but we sh knew that the organization showed a lot of variation on important attributes about their leadership team, their methods of financing, and their business strategy. So we started coding them for the presence or absence of these different attributes. And we began to see how companies are actually assemblages of different attributes. Um, we turned to hierarchical cluster analysis. It's an approach that's been used in very different settings, building family trees, uh, studying immigration, genetic sequencing, to try to understand the patterns. And voila, there seemed to be two models, one very cohesive, coherent, and another a clear branch of the family tree, but with points of divergent off of it. And as we tried to make sense of these branching tree models, a quote from one of our sources popped into our head. So the quote is from Robert Luciano, who was CEO of Sharing Plow, the large pharmaceutical firm. At the time, his company acquired a, a small Palo Alto-based startup called DNAX that had been started by Nobel laureate and Stanford professor Arthur Kornberg. So Luciano said, quote, Sharing Plow is not in business to do research. It's in research to do business. Now, of course, we couldn't resist transposing that idea as the label for our two main clusters in this uh, cluster analysis. We called one cluster in business to do science and the other cluster in science to do business. And this fundamental divide captures how amphibious entrepreneurs coming out of the university, blended academic norms with venture capital practices to create these odd science-based companies who used venture capital financing to fund cutting edge research. And they went after home run drug development, new to the world medicines. Now, in contrast, the business executives who ran their Com the companies in their cluster, they brought a more conservative short-term focus to this new freewheeling world of biotech. And they attempted to create fledgling firms that had guaranteed sources of revenue. So in one cluster were companies like Biogen, Cetus, and Genentech, all very science-based. And in the other main cluster were firms like Amgen, Centacor, and Genetics Institute. This contrast um, helped us understand something really critical, how two different models could view the exact same practices through completely different lenses. For example, one group freely published their research in leading scientific journals. Genentech was often ranked in the top two or three among um, the most productive organizations in molecular biology um, journals. Um, whereas other groups saw um, publishing as literally giving away their crown jewels. Uh, that was a direct quote from, uh, from an executive. Um, a comparable divide occurred when some firms were acquired by big multinational pharma companies. One group saw this as a huge success, cashed out with excitement, laughed all the way to the bank and then off to the Maserati dealer, um, while another group saw it as a sign of failure, that their book was never finished. Immunex actually held a wake when it was acquired by Amgen, bearing a coffin through the streets of their Seattle neighborhood. So we found that this um, insight uh, had numerous implications for the study of entrepreneurship. And once you have a fertile idea, you start seeing it in practice everywhere. For example, a postdoc working with me, Anders Kraba, is studying the plant-based food industry. He's interviewing founders, funders, as well as rivals from the meat industry. The big divide in this new industry is between taste and texture. This distinction, born out of academic versus industrial roots, drives the rivalry between the two leading firms, Impossible Meats and Beyond Beat. It shapes their business models and influences how they see their contribution to the world. One focuses on climate change and the other focuses on a healthy diet. Another example is the transposition of cutting edge computer graphics research into the realm of Hollywood filmmaking. The amphibian in this case is Ed Catmull, a PhD computer scientist whose small group of computer graphics researchers ended up 
basically getting acquired by Steve Jobs and rebranded as Pixar. Animated filmmaking has never been the same. And the way Catmull describes Pixar's brain trust, these meetings where new film projects are proposed and refined, it sounds an awful lot like the way an academic research seminar is run, with the same kind of norms of participation and sort of a non-hierarchical approach to everybody contributing. These two examples um, helped us recognize the power of transposition as a way of building new organizational models. Amphibians take ideas from one domain and insert them into a new one. And that move is rife with creativity as well as tension. When that move is done from a nearby domain, the adjacent possible in Stuart Kaufman's language, we often get important but incremental innovations. When that move is done at great, a great distance, failure is much more likely to occur because the new entity is unrecognizable. But when such far from norm uh, inventions take root, they have extraordinary, powerful, transformative effects. We've developed these ideas uh, about the important role of amphibians in creating novelty at greater length in a recent chapter in the Oxford Handbook on Entrepreneurship and Collaboration. And Kurt, you and I could go on at great length about this, but for the yes, sake of can. brevity, we should wrap this up for now and ask people to look at the paper. Thank you. Thank you.